my name is Enrica Piccardo and I'm the head of uh, the center and a professor at OEZ, University of Toronto. I saw that many people joined us since we first introduced the uh, symposium. So good morning or good afternoon, depending where you are. And uh, uh, hello, everybody. And I'm very pleased now to be able to introduce uh, our first plenary speaker, um, Professor Faranas Faes, and she is uh, from Western University, one of the universities that also collaborated in the in this symposium. So we are delighted to welcome our first plenary speaker, Dr. Faranas Faes from Western University's Faculty of Education. We are welcoming Dr. Faes back as she graduated from OISIS Curriculum Teaching and Learning PhD program in 2007. Congratulations are also in order as Dr. Faiz has been promoted to full professor at Western effective July the 1st. So many congratulations. Um, Dr. Faiz is co-editor of the Tessel Canner Journal and an editorial board member for the Journal of Second Language Teacher Education. She's also written numerous books, book chapters, and journal articles in the areas of language teacher education, beliefs, identity, self-efficacy, proficiency, and moving beyond the simplistic native-non-native -native teacher dichotomy. Her talk today centers around these themes, so let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Faranaz Faiz. Thank you very much for being with us. And Thank you so much. Before before uh, Dr. Faranas addresses the audience, uh, I just wanted to make a little comment that uh, we have prepared a document that I will post on the chat box for folks to ask questions or make any comments on Dr. Faranas' uh, presentation. Um, feel free to use the chat box as well, but then because sometimes it, it fills out, so it's difficult for us to follow up and go back and find the information. So we are we're allowing a document that you will be pro asking the question whenever you get the chance. So I will put them in the chat box in a moment. So in the meantime, Dr. Farnas, go ahead and um, uh, start your talk. Thank you, Yusid, for reminding this. Thank you very much. So Farnas, thank you. Good please. morning, everyone. Um, thank you, Enrica. I'm um, honored and humbled by this invitation to give the talk today. I'm also thrilled to be here. Thanks for your attendance. I understand this is like the time of uh, Zoom fatigue. So if you're prefer preferring to sit by the computer and listen to my talk instead of going and enjoying the weather, pressure is on me and I'm hoping that um, you find the talk useful. With that, I think I'll uh, start with uh, sharing my screen and getting right into the uh, presentation. Okay, um, I don't know how this is possible in a face to face context, I would usually ask people to interrupt me if something is unclear, but I don't know how it would work actually in an in a virtual environment. So, um, yes, um, feel free to type in your questions and, and we'll get the conversation going. Um, after the talk. So today I'm going to be talking about teacher language proficiency and teaching efficacy. Okay, I'll put this right into presentation mode before. Okay, so is this good? Stephanie? Okay. Okay. So I'm going to be talking about teacher language proficiency and teacher efficacy, and I'm going to be talking about relationships and impacting factors. I'm gonna be presenting three related studies. The first one is a meta-analysis that looks at the relationship between teacher language proficiency and teacher efficacy. Then I'm gonna be talking about generally other factors that have been discussed in the literature in relation to uh, factors that impact self-efficacy such as language proficiency, teaching qualifications, linguistic identity and teaching experience. And then I'm gonna be zeroing in on the uh, notion of general language proficiency versus classroom proficiency and their impact on self-efficacy. So 
Um, the first study is a meta-analysis that I conducted along with my then uh, doctoral uh, student, Michael Karras. He's now at Renison College and Takumi Uchihara, who was our uh, meta-analysis expert. He's also graduated from our program. And we looked at the, the relationship, basically. And to provide you with a little bit of background, um, there's no um, uh, doubt in the role of, uh, worldwide role of English and as a lingua franca. And with that, there's an increased uh, demand for wanting more effective language teachers. Um, globally, we know that more than 80% of our teachers don't speak English as their first language and anecdotally higher proficiency is often associated with more effective language teaching skills. However, as language educators, we all know that defining proficiency is not an easy or a straightforward uh, matter to deal with. We know that proficiency is contextually bound and different contexts require different levels and even types of proficiency. So for example, um, the proficiency that a teacher, uh, ESL, uh, EAP teacher needs to teach university level EAP in, the, in Canada can be very different from wanting to teach English in the elementary class uh, uh, in an EFL context. And then Mahbub and colleagues also remind us that proficiency in one variety doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, that person is proficiency in all varieties of any language, not only English. However, we know that English proficiency is important. Um, again, there's been um, a, a lot of um, anecdotal evidence that language proficiency can help teachers in the classroom. It can help them be provide good models for students in the classroom. Um, their proficiency allows them to maintain fluid target language use. They can easily identify student errors. They're uh, able to provide feedback to students and they can engage in impromptu teaching and more communicative language teaching methods, as Richard suggests. However, we know that the emphasis on language proficiency has had, you know, some undesired outcomes because um, in a lot of contexts, unfortunately, it's the nativeness that is associated with uh, more effective teaching. And then there are calls to remind us that native like mastery of the language is not even necessary for being able to teach it well. Having said that, when we look at the list of competencies for language teachers, language proficiency is, is cited as a fundamental competency for language teachers. But then it becomes tricky as Freeman because language becomes both not only the content of instruction, but the medium of instruction as well. And they're so intertwined, language and pedagogy is so intertwined in the language classroom. And that's why when we're looking at self-efficacy, why it reminds us that language proficiency is sometimes even confused and infused with, with uh, language proficiency. Looking at the studies that have looked at this relationship, they show between proficiency and efficacy, they show a low to moderate relationship, which I'm going to talk about further as we go along. So why self-efficacy? Um, self-efficacy is based on Bandura's uh, sociocognitive theory. And what he suggests is that people's level of motivation, affective states, and actions are based more on what they believe than on what is objectively the case. This quote is very important. And from a theory of self-efficacy, it has been used in many fields, including education. And Dillinger and colleagues have defined based on that um, teacher self-efficacy as teachers' individual beliefs in their ability to perform specific teaching tasks in the classroom at a level of quality that they, they deem appropriate. In, in a lot of fields, this has been used and Bandura also claims not only for teaching, but for all fields that when measured appropriately, it can be predictive 
of actual behavior. That's why when looking at our interest in looking at language proficiency was to look at how does it correspond with teaching ability. That's why studies have looked at self-perceived teaching ability, which is self-efficacy. So um, just as we do in teacher education, in language teacher education, we, brought, uh, we often borrow a lot of ideas from general uh, teacher education. It has been used widely in general um, teacher education. And higher self-efficacy matters because those teachers, according to research in general education, show higher, there's higher teacher motivation. They put more effort into their uh, roles in the classroom. They're more committed teachers. They show higher teacher uh, teaching effectiveness. They're less stressed teachers. And I've put an asterisk there because this is a more indirect, um, you know, a claim and a, and a stronger claim to make. Um, maybe not a study, but studies have said that, okay, if the teacher is highly efficacious, this, it impacts students' grades in the classroom. In language education, studies have looked at the teaching behavior of, of teachers with uh, highly efficacious teachers, and they've said that they use more communicative language teaching methods. They use more English in the classroom. There's lower attrition among those teachers. These teachers are more reflective teachers. And again, the same link is made with student achievement. Okay, so that's why a lot of studies that have been interested at the role of proficiency have come and looked at the relationship to see how are these two related. This is done mostly through correlational studies. Why do a meta-analysis? Because studies have shown inconsistent findings. And I've just provided a few examples for you here. For example, BEST in 2014 just shows a reliability of 0.13, that's low. Islami and Fatahi and Chacon, well, that's, you know, uh, low to moderate, maybe approaching moderate. And then this one is extremely, Rasem Boland is extremely high correlation. So that's why a meta-analysis, that's, that's what a meta-analysis does. If we bring all these st studies together, all these participants together, what would be the average correlation that we would have? I mean, considering. So the questions addressed by this meta-analysis uh, was, what's the overall relationship between language proficiency and teaching efficacy? And then we know that these studies have been conducted in different contexts and, and different participants. So we had to look at and use different measures, basically. We want to know how is this relationship impacted or moderated by these different variables that we have in these different studies. In particular, we looked at what if the, some participants had a different university degree, right? What if they had different teaching experience? Um, does the venue of publication matter? Does, do the scales of uh, how efficacy was measured and how proficiency was measured impact the results? And then we zeroed in, in particular, looking at not the broad proficiency and efficacy concepts, but how the subscales basically um, relate to each other. So in language, we know that we go with the typical listening, speaking, reading, writing. In self-efficacy, I will describe later, it's mostly done in terms of three subscales, which is classroom management, instructional strategies, and student engagement. Okay, I'll grab a sip of water. And so, as is common with um, meta-analytic studies, according to um, just go and do a broad search as possible. Try and find everything you can through all the databases. So we looked at Eric, you know, ProQuest dissertation, Google, Google, Google Scholar, and our library catalog. Use any keywords that you find relevant to the uh, topic under investigation. So we use teacher efficacy, we use teacher self-efficacy, and then we use language teacher efficacy. And for proficiency, we used all the keywords that we could think of. 
And we had written about this and we, uh, previously, so we did an ancestry search looking at um, any, any uh, uh, literature that we might find there. As is recommended by um, Luke Pl uh, Plomsky is that inclusion criteria should be as broad as possible. So any study that looked at this relationship was included. Of course, studies that were written in English and we did as you know recommended, we did include both published and unpublished. So unpublished theses and dissertations or uh, conference proceedings, we did include them in our analysis. Excluding criteria, studies that did not meet this criteria, duplicate reports because they skew the data. So Chacon is a dissertation, Chacon 2002 is a dissertation. There's a 2005 publication. We included the publication, but not the dissertation. And then a few studies like Leah and Praver, so they don't have a measure of proficiency. They include nativeness. So they look at nativeness, native versus non-native. But in order to do that average correlation, that meta-analysis, we needed a measure of proficiency. So that's why those two studies were excluded. In total, we identified 20 studies, uh, 12 journal articles, seven dissertations, and one conference proceeding. So as again is recommended in, in meta-analysis, just code for every variable that you can think of. And then later a decision is made as to what variable serve as a moderator variable. So we, we coded broadly study context, second language, where did they go institution type? Was it foreign language context, second language context? Who were the participants? Their age, their gender, their experience? What type of degree did they have? What's their first language? Did they have travel abroad experience? And we looked in particular at the measures used. We looked at um, where was the study published? What efficacy scale did they use? How did they measure proficiency? And um, was it was proficiency measured, you know, through a sample test? Was it an objective measure or was it a self-reported measure? And then both um, Michael and Takumi coded the data and intercoder reliability was really high. So what are the moderator variables that we decided to um, include? Um, based on the coding teaching degree. So we looked at whether teachers with a graduate degree, no graduate degree. Teaching experience, we looked at teaching experience. We looked at publication type and primarily because we had a, a sizable amount of you know, theses and dissertations, but we also had in the journal articles, a few um, articles that we were concerned about whether they're included in the top tier journals. So we looked at journals with impact factors versus journals that didn't have an impact factor versus theses. We looked at the type of how did they measure self-efficacy? We looked at the language. So whether the self-efficacy scale was administered in the teacher's first language, L1, or in English. And we looked at proficiency measures as I explained, you know, was it self-reported or did, were they given a sample or mock, let's say IELTS or a TOEFL test? So just to give you a sense of what, um, how efficacy, um, back in 2001, Shannon Moran, Wolf Fulhoi Hoy um, have developed uh, what uh, they have called the teacher sense of efficacy scale for general education. This has been done in Ohio State University and the study has been cited over 5,000 uh, times. It's been broadly used in general education. It includes either a short form of 12 items or a long form of 24 items. It includes three subscales of classroom management, instructional strategies and student engagement. So a good sizable number of uh, studies have basically used the TSES for the language classroom as is. So that's why we looked at it, Th that's, that's what they did. Um, four studies, as you can see, we call it the modified TSES. And that's when um, they've used the same items, for example, for student engagement, and I'm just making this up, I can engage my students in the language classroom or in the English classroom. 
So that's how they modified it. And three studies actually developed um, study specific context specific efficacy scale. So we wanted to know whether this, this made a difference. So our results, as is common in uh, studies, we use the software and we use random model um, um, to identify the strength of the relationship. I should note that in total, I told you we had 20 studies. We had to exclude one study. You remember that Los Angeles, uh study that reported 0.83? That was well above all other correlations. And a funnel plot um, analysis identified that that's a clear outlier that shouldn't be included in the analysis. So removing that, the correlation was 0.37. What does this mean? So this is um, uh, a low approaching moderate uh, correlation. So anything between 0.4 and 0.6 would be you know, moderate. And this is, you know, approaching moderate. What that means is that only 13% of the variance in self-efficacy is explained by proficiency. So self-efficacy of teachers, it depends on many of their pedagogical skills, not just language. So looking at the moderators, did degree matter? No, not significant. Publication type, our concern about whether these are reported in good journals or not so good journals or dissertation. No significant difference across the groups. Looking at the scale, this was interesting because um, 12 studies use the TSES. We have only four with modified and only three with other. But we can see that you know when they use language teaching specific skills, there's a higher correlation. However, number is small. This is significant, the difference is significant, but they're small. So yes, we can say that maybe if we use study specific, then the correlation will be stronger, but this needs to be verified by other studies. Proficiency measure. So I know there's a lot of, you know, we know there's a lot of reluctance to self-reported data. And again, the number is small, but then no significant difference between studies that use, use self-report or objective measures of proficiency. And then we look at the language. This was interesting because um, we only had 10, 10 studies in this um, uh, analysis, but seven of them used, um, translated it into students L1, and that shows a significantly higher. So maybe if the language is more comprehensible to the teachers, then they can report they report stronger um, relationships. Looking at the subscale. So as I mentioned, we looked at the correlation between overall proficiency and then the subscales of efficacy. We had eight studies to look, to look at this analysis. And again, the correlation between general proficiency and instructional strategies is higher. And this, this is significantly different from the others. It was interesting in one of the studies, Lee, where we had, uh, they reported qualitative data. They said in an EFL context, if you want to do classroom management, um, you know, uh, uh, task, you use their L1. So that's why it's not really needed, but it is needed for instructional strategies. And that's very telling. This is just um, a visual to show the strength of how instructional strategies, the effect size, you know, looking at how this is higher than the other classroom management and student engagement. Again, for this, we only had four studies, so we can't be, you know, conclusive, but interesting to see that overall efficacy correlates higher with listening and speaking. It makes sense because that's what teachers need more oral skills in, in, in the actual classroom. So, and this is a visual showing this, you know, how listening and speaking are higher than reading and writing. But again, the number is very small and we can't be um, conclusive about that. So what did we learn? There is a close to medium relationship between language proficiency and teacher efficacy. It's close to medium. 
Proficiency accounts for only 13% of the variance of self-efficacy. There's more to self-efficacy, teachers' pedagogical skills, right? Only two of the six moderators, which was the self-efficacy um, measure and the language of the scale were related to the variance in the effect sizes. The remaining four variables, publication type, you know, um, measure of proficiency, they didn't matter. But there was also a stronger correlation between um, proficiency and, and um, uh, correlation between proficiency and st instructional strategies. Um, and remember that these studies are um, almost all in an um, ESL context. Only one study was in an uh, all in an EFL context. Um, only one was an ESL context, but that was with regards to French FSL context. Sorry. So, limitations in future directions. What did we learn? I mean, yes, uh, proficiency measures were self-reported, so that could be a concern. But studies were almost exclusively in the foreign language context. Um, one issue was that efficacy was measured using a general education scale, so that's a concern. We didn't have any measure of actual performance. We don't know really how, you know, so the efficacy correlates with actual teaching. That's a harder data to collect. And of course, you know, studies with more objective proficiency and efficacy will yield, you know, maybe will yield more information. But, um, Shifting to what we learned from this meta-analysis is that a study that I, it's, um, I'm going to be presenting, which is based on Michael uh, Karras' uh, doctoral research, um, we looked at, um, as we were interested in language of, uh, teacher efficacy, we looked at um, language proficiency in relation to other factors that have been prominent in the literature, such as teaching qualifications, linguistic identity, and teaching experience. I'll pause and get a sip of water. And hoping that um, I'm explaining well and things are clear. Very so, clear, thanks. Okay, <laughs> thank you, Enrica. So looking at our research questions, as is typical, once you want to look at those variables, you look at the level of self-efficacy. So as I mentioned, there are very uh, few, if any, studies in an ESL context. So this is with teachers in Ontario. And we looked at the variables that I just mentioned. So LTE, language teacher education qualifications, linguistic identity, experience in years, and then looking at self-efficacy beliefs looking at the relationship. So why look at language teacher education? We know there are numerous pathways to become an English teacher, including having no qualification whatsoever. So we certificate diploma, bachelor degree, master's degree, and doctoral. So there are two types of studies that have looked at this, um, the impact of language teacher education. A set of studies have looked at the immediate impact. And what that means is that they looked at, you know, studies that have a pre-test, post-test design. That's not what we did in our, in our uh, study. We've looked at degree type. Like, would it matter if they have a graduate versus, you know, just a certificate to teach? And, and from literature, we know that studies, you know, degree type has shown mixed results. So that's why we thought it's worth looking at. We looked at the, um, you know, um, native, non-native um, category. We know it's simplistic. We know it's problematic. But then um, in EFL context, uh, non-native English speaking teachers have consistently reported lower levels of efficacy. So that's why I call, we need to look at these teachers in an ESL context. And then um, there's a call to look at a variety of, of um, linguistic backgrounds. So in our study, in addition to the native, non-native, we included an, another category that we call multilingual native speakers to acknowledge the language learning experiences of English speakers as well, to see how that's 
can or cannot be you know, impactful. In terms of teaching experience, um, it's been looked at in a lot of studies, um, but then the, again, results are inconclusive. It's interesting. Um, some studies report positive impact of experience, no impact of experience, and even negative impact of experience. But I'm, we did that, but I acknowledge that, you know, experience just measuring, you know, it by quantity and not looking at the depth and breadth of experience, that's that limited information can be gained, all that to say. So this is a small part of a large study, but most studies have looked at simple correlations. In this study, we wanted to look at these variables in relation to each other. So we used um, a survey to gather demographic information. We gathered self-reported proficiencies through the CFR, the global scale of CFR on a scale of one to six. And then we asked their language teacher education. We asked all the degrees that they had because people can have multiple, you know, they can have a certificate as well. And then in the analysis, we considered the highest degree. And, and we developed, uh, just as the shortcoming in the meta-analysis, we developed a survey in particular for this study, which I will explain later. First research question, I'm going to report only descriptive statistics. For the second, I'm going to report, you know, some of the analysis was done through multiple regression. So the instrument. I can't emphasize the amount of work that went into developing this instrument. Items were generated based on the literature and also TESOL standard documents as to what includes, you know, uh, um, a competency, but also, you know, um, uh, teaching specific task in the classroom. Bandura recommends that for using self-efficacy, so for measuring self-efficacy, items should be designed in the form of can, I can statements. Um, some studies um, have used, you know, to what extent um, in the form of question, but the I can statement format served our purposes very well. It also matches the CFR, so that was very good. And we used a six point scale. Um, we generated um, 63 items that went through multiple rounds of revisions with experts and, um, uh, and eventually with over 500 teachers, Michael did an exploratory factor analysis. The factor analysis identified six unique factors um, that I'm going to talk about. The overall reliability was 0.93, and the reliability of each individual factor was also within the 90s. So we can use each factor individually as well. And I explain that, I will explain that further. So the instrument. I'm only showing a snapshot of um, one item for each of the subscales. So for classroom proficiency, we had, I can use English to provide written feedback. For learner-focused instruction, one example includes, I can make appropriate use of learners' first language skills. Assessment, I can design appropriate assessment tasks. Language instruction, I can apply my knowledge of structure of words when teaching. Culture, I can use my knowledge of word cultures to guide instruction. And materials, I can use appropriate resources and materials. Sorry. Getting another sip of water. Okay, so I have particular interest in this classroom proficiency subscale. So the, the way this construct is defined, it's teachers' confidence to effectively use English when teaching. The, fa the seven factors that loaded strongly under this factor, I can use English as the medium of instruction. I can use English for all classroom functions. I can use English to provide spoken feedback in class. I can use English to provide written feedback. I can model natural English use. I can use English to manage classroom interactions. And I can use common phrases and words that frequently occur in English language classrooms. So remember that I mentioned, you know, how um, 
language proficiency can be intertwined with efficacy. And you can see from the nature of the items that they're not language, only language, and they're not just pedagogy. They're so, you know, language and pedagogy and discursive knowledge is so intertwined in, in, um, in the um, items. And, and that's what um, um, uh, Freeman talks about, you know, teachers, English for teaching skills. So the items were developed based on, um, you know, um, his um, work on the, you know, English for teaching and also uh, drawn also from Richard's work on the push for classroom proficiency and English for teaching proficiency. So ESL context, if we remember, gender is very much representative of the, you know, um, uh, teaching population. We asked for uh, all the degrees that they had in analysis considered, we had to include only, you know, the highest degree. Teachers reported their proficiency, mostly not surprising in the ESL context at the C1 and C2 level linguistic identity, we had the monolingual native speaker, we had the multilingual native speaker, and we had the non-native English speaking teacher. Okay, levels of efficacy. So on a scale of six, you can see that classroom proficiency is, you know, 5.61. The lowest item is learner-focused instruction at a 4.68. Um, we might think that, oh, this is very, you know, it's close to six, so it's high. But we don't have, because the scale hasn't been used with other people and in other contexts, like we can't make that kind of comparison, but we can compare them together in relation to what, what they know. So teachers more felt most comfortable with their language in the classroom, and they felt least comfortable with their, you know, giving, infusing L1 and, and students L1 and culture in, in their work. So looking at the factors that impacted, as I mentioned, teachers with C1, C2, we looked at their average years in experience, and we looked at whether teachers held an MA degree or didn't hold an MA degree or higher or no MA degree, and the linguistic identity. So what I'm showing you here is a multiple regression, and um, we should be looking at the um, R square, which is 16%. What this means in multiple regression is that 16% of the variance in self-efficacy is described by these factors. I'm only showing factors that were impactful. So language teacher education didn't impact self-efficacy. Proficiency significantly impacted self-efficacy. And 4% of this variance is attributed to proficiency. Teaching experience over 5%. What is also very interesting is that, so we had three categories for the native, for the linguistic identity. And the way we had to do the analysis was to use a comparison category. We use the non-native category as a comparison category. So when we look at comparing non-native speakers to multilingual native speakers, there's no significant difference. Non-native speakers report higher, but there's no significant difference. But when we look at the non-native category in relation to monolingual native speakers, they report higher levels. The difference that they report is significant. And linguistic identity accounts for 3% of the variance in self-efficacy. So what does that mean? Overall self-efficacy, 5.31 out of six. Teachers were most conf confident in their classroom proficiency factor. The lowest subscale was learner-focused instruction, indicated that teachers felt less confident in their capabilities to incorporate students L1 and L cultures. And again, that's not very surprising. Looking at the factors, proficiency in line with other studies significantly impacted self-efficacy. Teachers who self-assessed their proficiency at the C2 level showed higher levels of self-efficacy compared to the C1 level. Experience significantly impacted self-efficacy. 
it's in line with some studies, but counter to others. But it can depend on the scale. It can depend on so many factors. And knowing the value of experience in years is really limited. So I don't have much to say about that other than it's that we've included that as a factor too. This is a very interesting finding, linguistic identity. This is counter to all the studies that, you know, all the studies have been in uh, EFL context and consistently reported lower levels of self-efficacy for non-native teachers. This group showed higher self-efficacy. Interesting was that there's no significant difference. So even though we say they're, you know, they report higher than the multilingual native speakers, but that may just be just because it's not significant, it may be due to chance. So, but what is interesting is that it's significantly higher than the native English speakers. And we attribute that to the high levels of language proficiency of non-native speakers in an ESL context. Language teacher education, consistent with a lot of studies, doesn't make a difference, didn't make a difference in their self-efficacy beliefs. Okay, so now I am going to be, this is work in progress that, I mean, it's based on a small part of Michael Karras' uh, doctoral research that um, we're fleshing out uh, furthermore. So um, as I said, I would like to, we're interested in looking at classroom proficiency in relation to general proficiency. So in terms of approach, it's very similar to the study that I just explained, but it only draws on uh, non-native English speaking data from foreign language contexts. So again, I'm going to report their efficacy beliefs, but then I'm going to be looking at um, the variable of classroom proficiency versus general proficiency in particular. Okay, so data, we had a, a represent, representation from all continents, 213 participants. Gender, again, is can be represented, uh, representative of the general you know, teaching population. And again, we ask for language teacher education qualifications. So we're only looking at non-native English speaking teachers. So that's why it's not included here. Level of self-efficacy, well, they reported higher levels of self-efficacy for using and adapting material in the classroom. Assessment is lower. Um, and it can't be compared to any other scale. So we'll just leave it as is, but you know, uh, we're looking at them in relation to each other. So what did we do? So in the previous analysis, we looked at the self-efficacy scale as a whole. Here, we played with our data. We looked at, we, we're doing some theory testing here. We're, we wanna look at classroom proficiency as one subscale in relation to general proficiency as measured by a CEFR, like using um, um, seven, eight, items. So it can be very similar to the way we're measuring and the reliability of each sub, uh, sub factor was really high. So we're looking at classroom proficiency, general proficiency, teaching experience and language teacher education. And we want to know what's the predict, uh, which, which factor predicts each of the subscales of the efficacy that we had. Okay. So Remember, we had six sub-factors. One was classroom proficiency. We had language instruction. We had culture. We had material. We had other. So we're doing this analysis. We're pulling out classroom proficiency. We're looking at it in relation to other factors and looking at to how can they predict efficacy in language instruction. This is a multiple regression we should be looking at the R squared value, which came to be 36, which means 36% in the variance of efficacy in language instruction is due to these factors. 
24% of the variance is attributed to classroom proficiency, unique variance. None of these other factors are significant. What does this mean? Classroom proficiency, if we do general proficiency, it will be significant, but in relation to each other, classroom proficiency is much more impactful for efficacy in language instruction. Another example, with regards to the assessment sub factor, we're looking at multiple regression, it's 47%, which means that 47% of the variance in self-efficacy and assessment is attributed to these factors. 36% of the unique variance is attributed to classroom proficiency. Again, general proficiency is not significant compared to classroom proficiency. Teaching experience came to be significant, but only small, very small. I'm showing the other three factors and I'm not showing you all the analysis because we were only looking at theorizing basically, looking at classroom proficiency in relation to general proficiency. Classroom proficiency was the only significant predictor for the remaining analysis too. So for learner focused instruction, the R value, the squared value comes to 30%. 22% is attributed to classroom proficiency. Culture, 35%, 27% of the unique variance is due to classroom proficiency. Materials, 55%, 40% of the unique variance is attributed to classroom proficiency. Okay, so I'm gonna um, um, talk about a few points. What, what did, you know, takeaways from this talk? From the meta-analysis, yeah, proficiency is important, but there's more to teacher confidence, there's more to self-efficacy than just language proficiency. Second talk, a second, a second study looking at, yeah, native speakerism is uh, pervasive and prevalent, but non-native English speaking teachers with high levels of language proficiency, they showed highest levels of self-efficacy. Compared to multilingual, mono, uh, uh, multilingual um, native speakers, no significant difference. So what we're taking away is that successful language learning experience appeared to be significant, important. With regards to what's happening in the emphasis, the over-reliance on general proficiency, I think we're find, our findings suggest that we should have a perceptual shift to classroom proficiency rather than general proficiency for, for language teachers. And there should be a lot of support for English for teaching. And this can have very important implications for language teacher education programs preparing, you know, for, um, I think it can go beyond, you know, English for any language. So sorry if I zoomed through um, the talk. I don't know how, how I'm doing with time, but um, I'm, I'm willing to um, um, stop here and welcome your um, comments and questions.